Hey, Denise. And um, so we're just, we can really get started at any time if we want. I know Senator Rose Pep stepped away for a minute or two, um, but this is the session on apprenticeships in Germany with Professor Mulema, um, who is at the University of Munich, I believe. Yes. Um, yep. And so, but we're actually gonna start with Delegate Ampri this morning as he went on the trip and he could kind of set the stage and then Professor will shift over to you for your opening remarks. And then just as with these other sessions, we will just have a discussion for the most part. So um, Delegate, would you like to start us off? Yes, thank you so much. Um, just as a heads up, unfortunately, I'm double booked today. So I have to talk and I kind of got to run off, um, unfortunately. Um, my schedule got more jam-packed today than I wanted it to be, um, but happy to speak briefly about my time in Munich. Uh, first time to Germany, it's a good time. Um, it's all Again, it's always good to experience the culture of a new place. Um, I knew beer was a big deal in Germany, but I didn't know it was that big of a deal. My goodness. Uh, <laughs> It's, I feel like it, you know, they like beer is like water there. Uh, seriously, uh, <laughs> almost every meal. Um, but you know, our uh, trip was great. Unfortunately, uh, COVID uh, kind of hindered us from being able to do some more of our visits. And actually, I think I actually got COVID three days later after I left. So I think I, it also got me there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I'm oh, sorry. Did someone say something? Oh, okay. Um, so. Anyway, we had, we had an opportunity to go meet with the uh, some uh, another uh, state official <coughs> close to the capital and learn more about the apprenticeship programs that they have in Germany. Um, and then we also had an opportunity to sit down via Zoom with Secretary, uh, well, someone from the Department of Commerce or the equivalent of the Department of Commerce to learn about the systems there. Um, I, I would say that the thing that was really um, impressive about Germany was, you know, it seems they really have it nailed down on their apprenticeship models. The state is really committed to something that stood out to me during some of the presentations and learning the state's commitment to the trades um, and the understanding of the importance of what it means to the economy. Um, it, it seems that the state is just as own. I think here in America or in Maryland, uh, our trades are important to us, but I feel as though our, 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 our unions and our trade associations are the major, you know, um, cheerleaders for it, but it appears the state is even, the country's even more on board in Germany. Um, and as far as a comparison point, I found the UK to be a little bit more comparable to the United, to, to what we have here in the United States, because college is something you have to pay for. Um, so there's, 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 there's the apprenticeship degree models and all that kind of stuff would more so mimic what we're trying to do here. The thing about Germany that was really impressive or, you know, things different is that, you know, college is free. Um, so that a lot of what we can possibly do here is uh, pair it with our systems in regards to our community college systems. Um, but the other thing that stood out to me about my time in Germany and learning more about the apprenticeship models is how early uh, the conversations and I don't want to say the tracking or just how early students are pushed into uh, their, their, their their careers. You know, I've learned that it's talked about in elementary and middle school in Germany on as students make decisions on where they want to go as far as uh, careers and their eventual education. So, um, and, and I think that also allowed for this culture of apprenticeships being just as valued and thought highly of as going and getting a degree. Uh, there felt to be more of a cultural, a cultural acceptance that both are just as equally as satisfying, um, you know, both are as equally as gratifying. Both are equally as as held and held in somewhat of high, of a high regard. So I think um, something to aspire to to have here in Maryland um, is working towards again that um, that stigma or that belief that you know when you, you we had a family reunion and that cousin that you thought was so bright is now going to trade school and you think or they're going down the apprenticeship model you think oh. Oh, I thought you would do something different, but that's great. Like, I think that's what we need to be say, be excited about, right? So I think Germany has figured out that cultural component of it being um, accepted. So I think, you know, uh, figuring out how we can replicate that in Maryland is going to be super, super helpful to the success of any type of apprenticeship models that we have. But again, the trip was great. Um, you know, there's a lot to take in. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing as much as I can. We're going to have to leave a little early uh, from our presenter today to learn more about some of the uh, the the work that they've been doing in Germany over the years. But again, great trip. 
And I look forward to, to hopefully going back and exploring some other countries and learning about what they're doing. Because also in Germany, we learned about some of the other things that they, they work with the neighboring countries in the EU. Um, so I'd love to learn more about that. But again, great trip and look forward to hearing more. Thank you so much, sir. We um, appreciate that. And I'm sorry to hear you got COVID. <laughs> um, kind of makes the end of the trip is not as great. But um, Professor, can I turn it over to you if you want to start with opening remarks? Okay, thank you. Well, it was, was interesting to listen to your experience. I'm glad you had a, a good trip in Munich, uh, besides the bad ending. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe just that you know my background. Uh, I'm originally Swiss, so I, I grew up in Switzerland and got my education there. So I'm also familiar with the Swiss system. That's how I actually started in, in academia. Uh, but now I've been for 10 years here in, in Munich at the university, and I mainly do research uh, on uh, apprenticeship and, and training systems and also some some kind of comparative work and much of it with, uh, with Switzerland as well, sort of the contrast between the two, the two systems that are actually the largest in terms of uh, cohort chairs to go into the the dual apprenticeship so where training actually happens in uh, in the companies uh, as well yeah so um, i was uh, asked to just uh, talk for a few minutes initially and then talk a bit about the german system so um, i selected a few topics that you may or may not yet be familiar with and uh, then yes i'll be happy to uh, go into more details in, in any of the areas that uh, that you're interested in um, so regarding the school system in, in Germany, we already heard there is in uh, some some German states at least a very early uh, selection into what, what we call here the, the academic high school track uh, or then um, the non-high school track, which is, well, still, you know, regular school up to grade nine or ten. Uh, so what we call high school in, in Germany um, you know, in other countries, it would just call uh, going to school. But it is it is clear in Bavaria, for example, already after the fourth grade, that if you're in the high school track, typically you would be uh, heading towards university after uh, completing the high school qualification. Uh, whereas starting in fifth grade, you're on, you're on the other track. Uh, most often you would then do the, the route that eventually goes to, to vocational training. So on, on average by now, it's about half of a cohort who still enrolls in apprenticeships in Germany, uh, eventually, not, not all directly after finishing school, some, uh, some later as well. Uh, and the selection, as you can imagine, if much of it happens in fourth grade, it depends quite a lot on, on socioeconomic background. Uh, here in Bavaria, it's actually the, the most. Uh, so your parents' education very much determine uh, which way, which way the the kids go? So so that's actually turns out to be a little bit of a, a problem here as well because uh, it's difficult to kind of go back out of the academic track and into the high school and into the vocational track uh, because kids are very much discouraged uh, to do so. Even if, for example, at age fifteen, it kind of is obvious that it might be better suited in that track than in the academic track. Uh, so that just as a uh, as a little uh, background. Um, so those who uh, take the academic route up to age 18, I believe that would be similar uh, as in, in Maryland or in, in the US in, in many states. Uh, most of them actually then do go on to, to university, uh, but not all. Uh, we've seen in Germany in the last uh, 10, 15 years, the, the share of kids who enroll into the academic track has, has increased uh, quite a lot. Uh, but actually, so does the share of apprentices who have a, a, a high school qualification. Uh, so particularly in those states in Germany, often the small city states, we have now uh, more than half of a cohort who initially enrolls into the academic track. Uh, but then many of them don't go to university or, or go and don't succeed and then, and then do an apprenticeship. Uh, so that's a bit of a, a trend that, that we've seen in the past. Uh, and as well, there's uh, uh, in, in Germany, we have the traditional universities, uh, but then there's also, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, what's called the Fachhochschulen or the Universities of Applied Sciences. That's the English translation that's uh, known here. Uh, it, it is a, a bit a more practically oriented type of university. So I think maybe it's not, it's different, but it's maybe somewhere uh, more comparable towards community colleges. 
uh, even though we can graduate with a, with a four-year bachelor's degree. Uh, so that actually um, increased a lot in popularity in the last year. So by now, uh, the share of those graduating from university or University of Applied Sciences in Germany is actually now 50-50. So it's even though you, you think that all oh, everybody goes to university now, it's actually half of those with the academic tertiary qualification, uh, only half of them have the traditional university and the other half have uh, the University of Applied Sciences. Uh, and also, uh, just another figure, uh, of, of all university students now, it's roughly one quarter in Germany uh, who have previously completed an apprenticeship. Uh, so I think that's uh, one aspect that's important to highlight, both I think in Germany and also in Switzerland, is the permeability of the school system. Uh, so even if you start out as an apprentice, it doesn't mean that you cannot make your way back into the, the university system. Uh, so a lot of my students actually, they have previously completed an apprenticeship and often they, they do quite well because they have some work experience before and they're often very, uh, very motivated. Um, so uh, I think that's a, an important aspect in, in Bavaria, uh, again, Germany, the, across the different states, you have different uh, uh, different options. But in, in Bavaria, there's actually a, quite a lot of opportunities. So what you can do is you can do an apprenticeship. And after that, uh, you can go back to school for one year. And that would give you access to the universities of applied sciences. If you go back for two years, uh, you can actually get uh, the general uh, university entrance qualification. So you can go and study medicine, uh, whatever you like, even if you start out as an apprentice. Uh, it doesn't exist in all states, but in Bavaria, I think that's quite a, a good aspect. Uh, another option is if you complete high school and after age uh, 18, uh, you could do an apprenticeship. Uh, what's called dual studies and at the same time earn a bachelor's degree at a university of appliances or at the university uh, or now uh, in some states you can even do a triple degree uh, so you can get your apprenticeship you can get your bachelor at the uh, university and at the same time you can get the tertiary qualification in the in the vocational education and training system uh, so there's a, there's a number uh, of, of different options that are uh, available now. And at the tertiary level, now the German government actually made some efforts to, uh, to push that a bit to show that, well, if you're an apprentice, it doesn't need to stop after a three-year apprenticeship. You can go on and get a qualification at the tertiary level. Uh, they all had German names, these uh, qualifications, and now they rebranded it. It's called... Uh, bachelor professional and master professional. So even though it's not really comparable to what you can do in other countries, uh, it's uh, supposed to, you know, tell people that this is something uh, that might be equally important or similar to getting your your bachelor's degree at the at the University of Applied Sciences. Um, yeah, what are some? Uh, of the other aspects of the apprenticeship system. So one defining feature, I think, of the German system is that a lot of apprentices actually stay with the training firm, especially the large companies. Uh, they, they often train apprentices to, to retain them as skilled workers in the company. Uh, so it's typically more than 80% of apprentices stay on uh, in the large companies. Uh, and even in the smaller companies, it's, uh, it's 50%. Uh, so that's something that's in, in stark contrast to Switzerland, for example, where two thirds are gone within a year. Uh, and, and it kind of relates to the, the financing aspect. Maybe that's something we want to talk about it later. So in, in Germany, training an apprentice is actually quite a, quite a large net investment. Uh, apprenticeships range between two and three and a half years. Where the, the three and a half year apprenticeships are the, the most demanding ones, let's say BMW at, at Siemens. Uh, you would get these occupations as car mechanics uh, that are three and a half year apprenticeships where are sort of the most demanding and most of the skills are being uh, taught. And, and there an apprenticeship costs a company about uh, $35,000 uh, on average, which is quite, or euros. So it's a bit more than dollars right now, I believe. Uh, so that's quite substantial. And even for the, the two and three uh, year apprenticeships, it's almost 20,000 euros. 
Uh, so therefore, you see, well, the firms make an investment and they would obviously be interested then to have some kind of return on that investment. And to get that, you need to make sure that you keep the apprentice on for at least a few years uh, as, a, as a skilled worker. So that's, that's the main motivation in Germany why the companies train. Uh, in Switzerland, that's different. And actually, if you look at the, the studies that uh, I was also part of that, try to calculate these costs benefits. Uh, Swiss firms actually don't make a net investment, they actually make a small profit from training apprentices because the training wage is low enough uh, so that apprentices actually pay for their own training uh, by the productive work that they do uh, throughout the training period. Yeah, so in, in, in Germany each year, there are about uh, half a million uh, apprenticeship contracts newly concluded. And what's often a bit pushed on the sidelines, especially by the government officials, is that there is a quarter million. So this year it's exactly 250,000. Uh, who end up in what we call here a transitory system. So these are, are essentially individuals who were not successful in securing an apprenticeship so are, uh, and then get put in some kind of transitory measures typically to improve on their skills uh, or other kind of in, an, in a very non-systematic way. Uh, so, you know, compared to the 500,000 new contracts, 250,000 don't make it. So there is a... Uh, an issue about that, uh, maybe we can talk about uh, about that later, that not everybody who wants an apprenticeship gets one. Uh, and at the same time, actually, now, uh, there's a lot of companies, for example, in Bavaria here, who have a hard time to fill their apprenticeships, uh, particularly in those occupations that require um, relatively high level of, uh, of cognitive skills. Uh, and, and that kind of then relates to the uh, the school system. Uh, so for apprenticeship companies in Germany, uh, they pay quite uh, pay quite a bit of attention to the uh, how well uh, the kids did in school. So grades matter. We also have different levels of uh, lower secondary education here. Uh, so the higher education level, the better the grades. The more likely you end up securing uh, a good apprenticeship. Uh, and if the firms don't find uh, the right candidate, they rather leave the, the positions unfilled, uh, which, of course, then makes sense if you think, again, that training is quite a large investment and they only do, they on, they're only willing to make that investment for the individuals who they want to keep on as skilled workers later. Uh, so that's a bit one of the, uh, the problems that, uh, that we're facing uh, here at the moment. And... Yeah, what else? Um, kind of what uh, what came out a bit of our research, maybe just to put it into into context, is that uh, the the factors that uh, regulators can you know decide on uh, they seem to be quite important in terms of affecting uh, the company's willingness to offer training. Uh, so the wage is a is a big one here. So in Germany, we now have a national minimum apprentice wage. And that is now uh, was started, was set into place in the year 2020. Uh, and now each year uh, it goes up uh, more and more. Uh, so apprentices actually earn uh, quite good money now, on average about uh, between 1,000 and 1,100 euros per month. Uh, so compared to skilled worker that now almost reaches, uh, um, well, 40%, I believe. So it's, it's, going, it's going up. Uh, and therefore, it makes it makes it more expensive for companies, and and that's something that's especially um, tricky then for those school leavers who don't have the best of uh, cognitive skills. Uh, so, just one example was that in in the name of uh, you, you know um, ensuring that there is no discrimination against the younger apprentices, the collective bargaining agreements were adjusted so that regardless of the age, everybody gets the same training wage, which essentially means that while before those 18 and older would get a higher pay, now the young ones uh, earn more as well. And while that pay went up, at the same time, uh, the number of contracts concluded uh, with those kids who are younger and typically had uh, worse performance in school uh, went down a lot. Uh, so it can actually be that then if you if you come up with some measure that's supposed to be anti-discriminatory, 
uh, you end up actually introducing discrimination against the kids who uh, who don't have a, a very good background uh, from initial schooling. Uh, and I think that's that's also something that's consistent when you look across the border in Switzerland. Uh, there they they offer two year apprenticeships to to those who don't do so well in in school. They label it uh, the more practically oriented. And companies are still able to provide that training at zero net costs. Uh, and what you see then is that in Switzerland, uh, there's a lot uh, less who are uh, at age between 16 and 25 uh, who don't have any post-compulsory education compared to Germany. Uh, so that's that's one important aspect, uh, I think, to keep in mind that, you know, that there, it's good to have some flexibility uh, that those who need more training, those where companies need to pay more attention to, which is costly, uh, that they, uh, you know, can can be part of that investment and accept uh, accept a lower training wage. Yeah, so I think I've already talked for probably too much, so I better hand over the word now, and I'm happy to hear uh, more questions from you. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, commission members, do you have questions for him about the German system? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, my impression, I visited uh, Germany on a number of occasions and on one trip actually in Munich visited uh, a number of folks on apprenticeships. And my impression was, but I don't remember it precisely, that the administration of the apprenticeship system is divided into two buckets. One is basically the skilled trades, and the other is more the white collar and other apprenticeships. Did I have that clear? Yes, that's correct. Could, could you explain that? What are the different buckets? Who are the different entities? What's that system? How does that work? Yeah, so that that's essentially the the chambers, you know, the, the chambers of commerce, something you're you're familiar with, right? Uh, so there's there's different. Uh, chambers that are in charge of, of various occupations. Uh, so what, what is the case in, in Germany now is that uh, all occupations that uh, fall into the, the craft sector, uh, they, they end up being governed by this uh, chamber that covers uh, all the occupations in the craft sector. So that's called uh, uh, the um, Handwerkskammer, yeah, and then the other one uh, is the ones that uh, that covers the the white collar and the industrial sector. So anything related to to banking, to to engineering, uh, that's covered by this other uh, big association, uh, and essentially they just uh, typically repre represent uh, the interests of the employers. Uh, but at the same time, they're also involved quite a bit uh, in in, a, in actual aspects of organizing apprenticeship training. Uh, they're also in, in charge of doing the exams at the end of the apprenticeship. Uh, they're also helpful with in ensuring that young people uh, get apprenticeships. They encourage companies to to offer apprenticeships. Uh, so they they have a number of functions. It's it's less of the issue if you're talking about the chamber of uh, the crafts chamber uh, or the other one, uh, they essentially have the same tasks. They're just doing it for for the different occupations. Uh, if I can pursue that, what is the history of that? Why why was it split between the two buckets? <laughs> I think it's it grew organically over time. I mean, the the system in in Germany goes goes uh, way back. Uh, there used to be the the guilds. Uh, and and that developed, whereas back in the day you had each guild being in, in charge of their main occupation or, or, or few of their occupations, and, and some guilds still exist. So, for example, in uh, the baker occupation, uh, there, there's still a guild there, uh, but many of them have been dissolved, and um, I'm not, you know... Uh, a historian on this, but uh, from my understanding, it, it, it is that eventually uh, you have to have a, a body that functions a bit better so that you have more at the, at the more aggregate level, uh, that it, it turned from many small ones into one that kind of represents then the interest of all. Uh, but it's still, there is not just one big body. I mean, that's all in regional as well. Uh, and then even within regions, let's say, if you just take the one from Munich, they still have their, 
you know, kind of sub uh, sections then that uh, deal with uh, specific occupations as well. Uh, but essentially, they, they do represent uh, the interests of the uh, employers. So it's kind of the, the flip side to the, the unions uh, in Germany that are also always on the table when it when it comes to, um, you know, for example, updating training curricula. Uh, so in, in Germany, you have it that it's uh, both uh, the employer side, then the employee representatives represented by the unions, then the federal state, uh, and then also uh, the, uh, the Germany as uh, 16 states. Uh, so then also the, the federalist, federalist oh, sorry, the federal government has one seat at the table, and then also uh, the the states in Germany, they are, they're also represented. So it's kind of these four, four aspects. Federal state, because the, the system is governed by the, the federal German government. So that's that's one central organization in Bonn, uh, Federal Institute of Vocational Education and Training. Um, but they don't decide everything. The regional uh, states, they still they still have a say in the in the system as well. Uh, so the whole idea is that whenever there are changes made, uh, that everybody has to come together. They actually sit at the same table. They have an equal number of seats. Uh, and when it's decided about, well, how should we develop the new training curriculum or how should we update the curriculum for car mechanics sort of from, you know, things change a lot. We now have electric cars, so they need to know different, uh, they need to have different skills than 20 years ago when there were no electric cars around. Uh, so everybody comes together and uh, then they have to agree on what the new uh, training regulation should look like uh, so that the new apprentices <coughs> will have the skills that are uh, that that companies look for on the labor market. Thank you. Jake or Denise, did you have any questions? Yeah. Do, do you mind going into a little bit? I mean, it sounds like for the system to work, there has to be some pretty heavy investment in like vocational schools. Um, can you break that down a little bit, what that looks like? Yeah. So um, all apprentices go to vocational schools. So depending on the occupation, they may spend between one and two days, typically on average per week in a vocational school. Uh, then for each occupation, there is a, a specific uh, curriculum. Uh, so, you know, if you're if you're doing a banking apprenticeship, then there will be more subjects related to, um, you know, finance, math, and so on. Whereas, if you're in, in an apprenticeship for a hotel, uh, then there will be more things related to to what you need in uh, in a hotel. Obviously, um, that's all completely financed by the the state. And the curriculum is also decided, as I explained before, uh, by this joint process uh, between employer associations, uh, employee representatives, and and uh, the government. And vocational, the teachers in vocational school, they get their education just as uh, other teachers do. So they, they go to university uh, in Germany, they get a university qualification. And what else? Uh, so it's it's essentially like what you would see in in school uh, in in the high school track, except that the subjects are more specific to uh, whatever the apprenticeship in the particular occupation is. Uh, there are still subjects uh, for you know general knowledge. They they still have. Um, uh, subject on you know reading writing in the in the German language there is there is still math they still have uh, uh, for example ethics and religion uh, they uh, still have uh, politics and history classes so there is still uh, quite a bit of uh, general knowledge as well but then you have the more uh, the more specialized classes uh, that others wouldn't get in the in the high school track does that answer your question it does. I'm curious the extent to which, I mean, I know here in our public schools, we've seen a pretty 
big increase in um, like non-English learners. I think Baltimore City is up to like 20%. And I'm just curious if any of the decreases, at least in Germany, on the apprentices are due to kind of a similar um, demographic change in the schools too. There is a quite a bit of change going on in Germany. So we did have demographic change. So the the number of school leavers per se was was on the decrease in the last uh, almost ten years. Uh, then we had a lot of immigration. So in 2015, 2016, there was uh, what was labeled the refugee crisis. So there were a lot of refugees coming from from countries like uh, Syria uh, and Iraq, uh, and it's actually a, a lot of them. Um, after about a, a year, a good year or so, where they initially had to learn German. Um, in, in 2017 and 18, there were uh, several 10,000 apprenticeships that were concluded with uh, with refugees. So once they've mastered the, uh, the German language, and it's not possible, still not, there is a pilot project in one state where you can do an apprenticeship in English now. Uh, but other than that, you need to know German. You need to know German for the vocational school and also in the companies. Not everybody speaks English in, in Germany and not that every refugee speaks English. So so first, mastering German is, is kind of a, a prerequisite. Uh, but then actually many, many of them managed to, to get an apprenticeship because companies had a hard time to fill their positions uh, with kind of the local uh, supply. And at the same time, there was also a bit of a change in terms of preferences that the higher share uh, of the you know German uh, kids enrolled into the academic track. Uh, so there was a bit of a, a shift on that, uh, which again made it made it easier, I suppose, than that those who uh, who came in as refugees found uh, found an apprenticeship position. Um, in general, though. Uh, Germany also has a lot of uh, immigration that's not not a refugee uh, that who don't have a refugee background. Uh, their actually parents are often more critical of that. Uh, so particularly in Munich, uh, we have now quite a um, quite a lot of tech companies that are established here. So we we get quite a lot of, for example, Americans here, uh, and they're more they're more critical to send their children into apprenticeships because they're not familiar with it. And actually think, well, that's kind of the uh, the second best route. So, uh, so it's not a it's not a unique kind of uh, say. Anybody who's non-native either likes or dislikes apprenticeship. It depends a bit on the background. Typically, um, if the uh, non-German kids have uh, parents who didn't grow up here but have a, a university qualification. Uh, they typically push their their kids into the academic system, even if they don't necessarily have the uh, the grades to succeed later on. Jake, did you have questions? Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, I apologize. I joined a bit late here. I don't know if you covered this already, but I'd be really interested in knowing what is you know to the point around. Um, you made this point earlier, Samuel, around um, the potential sort of bias or disparate impact that you actually end up creating in terms of youth versus adult earners, since you're paying the same wages. Approximately how much, and, you can, and I know it's different in Germany, but compared to, let's say, the starting wage of a person who maybe comes into a role or an occupation, um, you know, with some experience that isn't going through apprenticeship versus somebody who's starting an apprenticeship at that early days of training, how what percentage of that starting wage is an apprentice at the earliest stage of this learning being paid? Mm. Uh, so you mean compared to somebody who who has a vocational qualification or somebody who doesn't have who has a vocational qualification? Uh, it's it's somewhere between thirty five to probably almost forty percent now. So apprentice pay has, has increased a lot in recent years, whereas for, for skilled workers, it increased a bit, but but considerably less. So apprentices have seen an increase of like six, seven, eight percent per year, whereas for skilled workers, it was much uh, it was much less. So, so it accumulated a lot. So as an apprentice now, you, you may start on average at a thousand euros per month and 
and if you have a, um, a you know an entry an entry weight for somebody with a diploma, you probably somewhere in the area of twenty five hundred. Uh, I, I would say so. It is. It is. Uh, uh, it is getting higher. Uh, at the same time, the minimum wage increased a lot here as well. Uh, so it increased from. It it was uh, set in twenty fifteen at eight seventy five, uh, and now uh, currently it's twelve fifty, uh, and they want to raise it up to fifteen euros per hour. Uh, so that's something else uh, to be considered for those who, you know, if you're not coming right out of school, but if you're already a bit older, uh, is it worth to do an apprenticeship if the minimum wage is already uh, is already this high? And that's uh, kind of an issue that we that we see in Germany here, particularly about uh, the non-Germans, that there is a very high share uh, of young adolescents who who don't have any post compulsory education. So it's those who initially end up in this transitory system who don't manage to get an apprenticeship. And eventually, once you're 18, you don't have to go to school anymore in Germany. Before, you have to be part of some kind of transitory measure that should help you um, increase your skills. Uh, but then you can work anywhere. Uh, and uh, especially in the last years, uh, companies will offer you some job. You make, you make money. Uh, so you're not unemployed, but you're also you're also not in education, and you don't have a post compulsory uh, qualification. And that's that's particularly about the non German nationals. It's it went up to forty percent now. Uh, those age um, sixteen to I believe thirty is the the cutoff. And so that's uh, that's definitely uh, an issue here that that has emerged in in recent years. And for example, compared to Switzerland, there. The, the shares are quite a bit lower. Thank you. Thank you. Um, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, Professor, you mentioned financing during your opening remarks, and I, um, I think that might be useful for the commission members to hear more about. Yeah. So um, there are in Germany since the the nineteen seventies, actually, they conduct these surveys on the cost and benefit of of apprenticeship training. Uh, it was initially uh, to make sure that the, the statistics are correct because uh, spending per capita in, in the German education system is always low uh, because whatever the firms invest wasn't counted and so many uh, young kids are in apprenticeship training. So that's why they started in the 1970s. Uh, and then over the years, these, these surveys were improved. Initially, they just included the costs. Uh, and now, since uh, the 90s, they also include estimates of the, the value of the productive work that the apprentices perform. Uh, and so uh, um, over the, the last decades, there was a very consistent picture uh, that actually the cost that the companies incur, so it's measured in detail in these questionnaires, they're about uh, 30 to 40 pages long, and interviewers go into the companies and talk to those responsible. Uh, of the training system. Uh, so the, the main expenses are just wage costs. So you have trainee pay, which is now the covers more than half of the, the cost is trainee pay. And the second important aspect is the, the cost for the training personnel. Uh, so you have the in-house trainers who spend several hours a week. On average, it's about uh, five to seven hours per apprentice uh, every week uh, that they you know, are not able to do what they usually do because they take time to to train the apprentice. And obviously that comes at the cost to the company. They pay uh, hourly wages while not getting, um, while, while they don't get their own work done. Uh, so that together combined uh, amounts to about an average, about 85% of the total training costs. Uh, and then the rest of it is uh, equipment, uh, administration, uh, they might need to have some machines or computers for, for apprentices, but that's typically the smaller part. Uh, so the main part of on the cost side is uh, uh, are, are salaries for the trainee and the trainers. Uh, and then on the benefit side, what the surveys try and do uh, is to estimate, well, how much time does an apprentice actually spend in the company? That's relatively easy because, you know, there's a few weeks of vacation and, you know, the time away in vocational school. Uh, so you know how much time an apprentice spends in the company, 
And then those who work with the apprentice are then asked to say, well, how much of the time is the apprentice actually working? Uh, and how much of the time is spent uh, just training kind of away from the workplace? Uh, and then the, the idea, without going into too much detail, is, is pretty simple. You, uh, you end up with an estimate then of how many hours uh, per week and then per year uh, an apprentice spends doing certain tasks and they differentiate by just easy tasks where you could hire anybody uh, at the minimum wage or the more skilled tasks where you would need somebody with a vocational qualification. Uh, but then they adjust it for the relative productivity, which is estimated by the instructor. So let's say if currently a skilled task takes the apprentice uh, twice as long as a skilled worker, the relative productivity would only be 50%. So it means if the apprentice uh, works an hour in skilled tasks, uh, the value of that to the company would simply be half of the skilled worker's wage that they would have had to pay a skilled worker to do the same work. Uh, so that's uh, that's the logic of it, uh, and then if you if you add up the costs and and these benefits over the years, uh, then you come up with this number that I mentioned earlier. That in in Germany actually they spend about thirty five thousand euros for a three and a half year apprenticeship on average net. So costs minus the value of the productive work, uh, and even for the the two and three year apprenticeships, it's it's almost twenty thousand euros. Uh, so it is. Uh, uh, it is a relatively high net investment uh, and the companies are willing to do that for those young people who they want to later on re retain uh, as a skilled worker in their company. So, so if you talk to them, also if you have qualitative items in these surveys, if you ask them, why do you train apprentices? The, uh, the answer is then typically, uh, or the the most selected answer is I, I do so to, to train apprentices that fit very closely the needs of my company. And then the question is, of course, you might say, well, why don't you just hire somebody from the external labor market? Uh, and sort of what came out over the last uh, decades of research is that, well, uh, you can hire somebody from the external labor market. It's not necessarily the cost to do so. Uh, that matter the most. But the issue is in Germany, once you've hired somebody as a permanent employee, uh, it becomes very expensive to uh, to fire them after some time if it turns out that it's a bad match. Uh, so dismissal protection is an issue. Uh, that's something that's uh, uh, quite different in Switzerland. Uh, there you can easily, sometimes you might have a, a month or two before you uh, somebody then actually has to leave, but you don't need to have a special reason. Uh, whereas in Germany, once after you, a few more people were hired, uh, they would actually first have to, to fire those who were hired last. So you can't just uh, lay off a particular employee who turns out to be a bad match. And so for German firms, it's actually important to, to learn during that apprenticeship period uh, about apprentices, whether or not they're a good fit. Uh, because after a few years, you have a much better idea, of course, if, if you know if if it's a good match in terms of who that person is compared to if you just hire somebody, do a few hours of interviews or an assessment center, you still uh, you still don't have a good knowledge. Uh, so that's one of the main reasons why the German firms are willing to make that investment. It's to ensure that whoever they offer after a fixed term contract uh, won't be kind of a, a mishire. I can follow up on that. So explain to me then, if you don't have that kind of job protection in Switzerland, why do so many Swiss firms do apprenticeships? Yeah, so the, the that's the flip side. So the, the Swiss firms don't make a net investment. And oh, so the, other, the, other uh, the other way, you, you said that. Yeah, so it's a, and and that's uh, that's the good point in in Switzerland is what well, I say we we still want to train because as uh, let, let's it's say we're the uh, we're the car it. industry so we want to make sure there's skilled workers in our in yeah. our industry in our occupation companies are willing to train even if they don't stay uh, right after as a skilled worker because they can say well if we need somebody we can hire an apprentice that was trained from a different company uh, we know that the monitoring agency is in place and the final exams at the end of the apprenticeship they ensure that whoever we hire I should be I should, I should, he, he grows the pool he grows the pool i understand yeah. in, in terms of the money um 
if, see if I got this right in Germany, it's obviously that the employer pays the wages. Got it. That's true. That's true in Switzerland. That's true in the UK. That's that's true in the US. The on the job training, obviously the cost, and that's what you referred to. You you build into what the cost of the employer is is the cost of the on the job training, and then in Germany, um, there's a question mark at the end of this. Um, and Germany, the off the job training is paid for by the government. That's why you think of it. Yeah. Who pays with these chambers of commerce that sort of administer the system? Who pays the cost of administering the system? Well, the the chambers of commerce they they are financed by by the companies through their through their memberships. Uh, so they're not the chamber of of commerce like the, the the chambers themselves. They don't they don't directly receive money from the government. Um, so the, the the companies they typically pay membership fees to to employer associations. And, um, and in the United States, chambers of commerce are very voluntary and don't have very big memberships. Is that true in Germany as well? You don't have to be um, there. I think there are a few exceptions in certain occupations where you have to be, but otherwise, I I. Um, also 99% sure that you don't have to be, uh, even though, you know, many are, but you, you don't have to, just like you don't have to be part of a collective bargaining agreement either, uh, except in, in some in some sectors. So typically it's voluntary, um, but uh, many do because you also have benefits from, uh, from these memberships. But are the, are the reasons to join the Chamber of Commerce primarily engagement with apprenticeships or primarily non-apprenticeship reasons? Uh, I think it's primarily not apprenticeship reasons. The apprenticeship are it's one part of what they do, but I think, I think otherwise it's just important that you're uh, that you're part of the uh, the chamber. What percentage of apprentices are sixteen and seventeen year olds or under eighteen year olds? Ballpark. I would say probably. If if you just take the. Uh, the newly concluded contracts, I'd say maybe half. Half start under eighteen. Yeah, I would say so. the The majority, the majority of apprentices, they don't have the high school qualification. Uh, they have the the lower schooling qualification, which ends at age fifteen, and for most at age sixteen. So you have ten years of school, then you're sixteen, yep. and then typically you you start as an apprentice. Uh, even though for some it will take an extra year, then they're 17. Uh, and then I say, well, 18, maybe, you know, maybe many are also 18. Uh, but I would say that uh, even though the average, I think, is now around 20 in Germany, uh, I think if you take the median, um, it, it's probably around 50%. Actually, I can look it up. I, I did write a paper on that once. I think I have the distribution, but I would say okay. No, that's fine. That's if, not, if not half, maybe almost half. I'm sure. Yeah, but the school leaving age is eighteen, right? Yes, but doing an apprenticeship is still Counts. considered part of the school system. Yes, gotcha. No, I I, I figured that. That's what that's what we're trying to do here in the United States in Maryland. Exactly the same thing. So that's yeah. very good to know. That that's the model. Yeah, um, so the, the the stereotypical apprentice here in Bavaria would finish tenth grade at age, depending when you enroll, either yeah, you're yeah. fifteen or sixteen, yeah. you finish tenth grade, and then you do your first year apprenticeship when you're seventeen, your second year you're eighteen, and you yep, graduate yep. at age nineteen, and yep. then you have your vocational qualification, and you've also finished your yeah, uh, I get your schooling. That's that's the idea. And you said for the apprentices, it's typically what I heard, and I think I heard this when I was in Germany too, it's typically like on average four days on the job, one day in classroom training. Is that the way to think about it from a scheduling point of view? Um, on average, yes. So if you if you have the more demanding apprenticeships, you might think more of one and a half or two days. Uh, and yeah, so so there is variation within across across the occupations, uh, and it also the schooling. It's not always that you go to school on Monday and uh, Thursday afternoon. Uh, so depending on occupations, they also have blocks. So you would have yeah, a, I, I, of a, a week of school or two weeks of school, I, and I then your company. So there is 
there is quite a lot of flexibility. The, the school I visited was like that. Yeah, the school I visited was like that. It was like three weeks on and two weeks. I mean, uh, three weeks working and like one week in school or something like that. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. I had a really good point. It, when we were there visiting, it was my understanding that membership in the Chambers of Commerce was actually mandatory? I think in some in in some uh, occupations or in some industries it is. Uh, in others, um, I I don't think it's in general. Um, I, I could look that up. Uh, it was because it was very different than the Chamber of Commerce here, because it was more like a regulatory body. In here, yes. it's more of an economic association. So it was a significant distinction. Because that I wondered my... also why people would join. That was my impression too when I when I visited yeah. folks in Germany, and that that is. No, you're actually you're actually right. I just looked it up now. You do have to accept where you're uh, the the pure crafts people. They don't have to, and in agricultural firms, it's also not. Uh, but but other than that, it actually says you have uh, you have to. Yeah, good that he brought that up. I, I knew I, I knew everybody kind of is. I just wasn't sure if you. If you actually have to or not, I, I know in Switzerland you don't. At least in some, you don't have to be a member. So I was a bit biased from that. Sorry, um, but yeah, good point. You have to. You have to be. Thank you for raising that. That's a, that's an important distinction in, in structure. Um, you mentioned that the curriculum is sort of agreed on and the standards by government, federal, state employers unions where unions are are relevant and i just want i think this is obvious but i just want to confirm it and i think it's true so the way the substance of the train the off the job training and on the job training is decided in germany for apprenticeships is a hundred percent different than the way academic training is decided in universities in as in the united states in universities it's the training institution, the university that decides what's going to be taught with perhaps asking some employers, with perhaps asking the government, with perhaps ask, asking a union, but it's controlled by the providers. Whereas in the apprenticeship, it's controlled by the consumers of the education. Is that a good way to think about it? Yeah, so in, uh, universities here work the same way. They can decide how, how they want to do it, even at the level of the, the faculty. Uh, so to, to be clear, for apprenticeship training, uh, whatever's being taught in the company or what the, what the curriculum says, what the company needs to teach, uh, that's regulated by the federal government. So there, the, the, the Federal Institute for Vocational Education and Training Again, not alone, in cooperation with unions and uh, employer representations, uh, they come up with a curriculum that's binding at the federal level. So wherever you are in Bavaria, in, in Germany, if you're a car mechanic, you, you're being taught the same thing in the companies. Uh, the school system is different because it's federalistic. So that's from what I understand is what, what you have in, in the United States as well. So every, every state has... Uh, makes their own decisions regarding uh, education. Uh, so what uh, the car mechanic learns in vocational schools in Bavaria may differ from the car mechanics in Baden-Württemberg. Uh, so there it's the, uh, it's the states that decide what's being taught in school. Uh, but every, every vocational school in Bavaria that has car mechanics, uh, they have to teach the same thing. Uh, so it's not that the individual school can decide on the content. Uh, every school in a state uh, has to teach the same according to the curriculum. Let me ask you a question. I, I don't understand that at all. And car mechanics is a great example. Why would Bavaria decide to have a different car mechanic curriculum than, um, you know, um, Berlin? I don't get it. Yeah, I could ask the same questions about the first graders. <laughs> um, in the end, you know, the, the curricula are likely looking quite uh, quite similar. 
Okay. Um, but they they essentially anything regarding education is decided at the level of the state. And if you want to try and change that, um, good luck. Um, so that's just how it's been. And it's very federalistic. Uh, same in Switzerland, actually. They're also the, the cantons decide everything what's going on with the schools. And the apprenticeship system is governed at the, at the federal level. Uh, it's just uh, the states, the, the ministers of education, they can decide. And if you know, if you can decide on something, you typically don't give up on it. But I agree with you. It doesn't make sense that the car mechanics in Bavaria get taught, you know, things. You know, I think those who worked eventually then work for BMW, they might need to know the same uh, as those who, who work in Saxony for, for Volkswagen. So. <laughs> Interesting. Well, but how do you integrate the on-the-job and off-the-job training then? I mean, in, in the U.S., we, we basically do it, and Chris McLaren, our apprenticeship director, is on the call here. It's integrated through the apprenticeship being approved by the state or federal apprenticeship council. And that plan has to include what's the on-the-job training and what's the off-the-job training. Do you have any system in Germany that integrates the on-the-job with the off-the-job training? Yeah, so that's all that's all decided at the at the same time. Um more or less what what's being determined at the federal level in terms of what are the skills required for let, let's say let's say they're they're gonna reform the, the car mechanic curriculum. Uh, then they would come together at the federal level in Bonn at the Federal Vocational Training Institute. Uh, all the representatives come together, the state employee representatives, employee representatives, uh, and then also the companies through employer representation would then say, well, what we need in the future is skill A, B, C, D, uh, and we need this and this many hours, and we, we're going to write up a new training curriculum, and every company has to make sure uh, that these skills are taught in the workplace. And then at the same time, uh, they also say, so what do we need for the school? Uh, and then typically they would say, well, is one day still enough? Uh, and if the answer is yes, then it's okay. Maybe we have to make a few adjustments. Maybe they need to bit, learn a bit more about electricity that they didn't know beforehand. And they need a bit less about something else. So, so they make these adjustments uh, based on what their joint decision is about what's needed. Uh, and I mean, it's clear that the sort of the, the general guideline is there will be you know, this and that much time when the apprentice is in the company. And during that time, you have to learn uh, all these skills. Apprentices also have to write it down on a weekly basis. They have to write down what they did every day, what they've learned that has to be signed by the uh, by the training instructor. And that will, when you, when you take your final exam, you also have to show that. And that's being checked that you've actually learned the stuff that the curriculum says you have to learn. Gotcha. Uh, so, so that's how that's typically how it uh, how it works here. But again, it's it's decided by the occupation, and it's not, you know, that BMW can say, "Well, I want to have my own apprenticeship program." I know that's possible in in some places in the U.S. That that this is then getting the approval, and you find some school to work with. Uh, here, it's the, that's the same for everybody. But do those federal rules apply to the local schools? I mean, does the, the federal agency or whatever whatever the organization is say, okay, for car mechanic, these are the skills that need to be taught in the school? No, it's because the the states are in charge of the schools. The federal government can't prescribe that in detail. But what they do, uh, what uh, what is always first is the uh, the federal level training curriculum of what happens in companies is first. And that includes what are the most important skills yeah. that are needed. And then the schools kind of have to follow and adjust uh, their curriculum that it fits with whatever uh, they agreed upon at the federal level, what, what has to be done in, in terms of what employers want. Uh, so it's not the federal government doesn't say the, the states word for word what to do, but essentially it's, it's determined it, 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 anyway. Oh, that's what I'm saying. It's kind of a process and a culture that gets the, the local schools to do what the federal government employers want them to do, as opposed to being able to tell them what to do. That's a, that's the way you describe it. Yeah, yeah. And it's and local being the state, so it's no, all the school 
in Bavaria have to do I, the I'm sure. thing. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Denise had to leave. Another question I want to ask you is to what extent are there apprenticeships in uh, public service in the federal government, state government, city governments? Uh, they have a lot. They have quite a lot, yeah. Gotcha. And what would you say, other than, other than the like what you guys call the crafts, outside the crafts, what would be the big buckets of apprenticeships by occupation or by industry in Germany? Um, well, the, the biggest one still, I think it's what's called in German Kaufmann. Uh, so it's uh, uh, essentially... Uh, if you're if if you're in banking, uh, then the typical apprenticeship would start out as those who who are um, you know behind the bank teller back in the day when that, when that still existed, and now obviously adjusted. They have, they have different roles, uh, so it's uh, um, actually looking for the for the word uh, in English. That's not uh, so that and, and that exists that occupation exists uh, you know in, in many different industries. Yep, yep. Uh, so that's that's I believe is is still one of the, the biggest. Uh, then you have I should actually quickly look it up then I can tell you that great thank you. The the proper give you the proper answer and it'll just take me a second here to find it. Because they have the uh, typically the ones uh, the list. So where are they? Top ten occupations. So there you go. Ah, so the, the top one is actually um Verkäufer, which means a sales 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 clerk. Uh -huh. uh, so that they, they can be in supermarkets, they can be in retail stores. Yep. Uh, so retail. that's the, yep. uh, that's actually the, the top one. So that's four percent of all. Uh the second one was the, the Kaufmann, so uh in 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 retail, those who do the you know you you order the goods that come in, uh, you make sure you see what's being sold. Uh, so so that's the second one. Uh, then hairdresser is quite popular after the fourth. Then logistics. Your hair, your hair looks great. <laughs> yeah, wasn't by an apprentice, but did an apprenticeship <laughs> in the past. Uh, then logistics, which I guess is. Transportation. Officially part of the craftsperson. Uh, so yeah, those uh -huh. who, who do logistics organization in, in warehouses. Uh, uh -huh. Then car mechanic. It's a big one, uh -huh. especially in Bavaria. Uh, then mechanic uh, in general, for, for example, for heating systems, uh, sanitary systems. Uh, so now in, in Germany, uh, we have a lot uh, of houses now who, you know, have to get rid of their um uh, old heating so you no longer heat with with gas or with oil and you'll uh, many of them switch to the uh, get the heating from the earth so you drill down the hole uh, oh right you get, right. you get that but it needs in terms of uh, installing all that you know you need you need different skills uh, so that's that kind of occupation where apprentices learn that mm -hmm. uh and then there's another one, a bit a lower level of the kind of office management, you know, office uh -huh. club. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, that's a big one as well. Uh, so these how were about, the uh, the top. Healthcare? Ten. What about healthcare? Healthcare uh, is big too, um, but they they have that separately now in in Germany. Uh, so it's not uh, it's not under those two big chambers anymore. Oh. It, it's uh, separately. Uh, it used to be school based. Uh, and now they recently reformed it that they they're treated more like an apprentice um but it's not it doesn't show up in the in the normal training statistics they they kept it separate uh, and switzerland actually. actually did the same thing it was always the the hospitals used to have schools for their apprentices 
uh, but they had a contract with the school, not with the hospital, uh, even though they spent quite a lot of time, obviously, in the hospital. Uh, so it, it's kind of a special way of how they of how they did the, the contracting. But it is a, it is a popular, um, a popular, uh, yeah, if you want to call it apprenticeship, yeah. How about how about hospitality? Restaurants, hotel, motel, yeah, tourism, all that's, that. Uh, that's popular uh, as well. Um, they have one for hotel management. Uh, they have in, in restaurants, you, you either have it for the waiters uh, or then cooks uh, as well. Uh, it's, there's a lot of um, premature terminations there. Uh, typically, the uh, the training is not is not that great. Uh, and often mm, kind of the, the work atmosphere doesn't appeal too much to the young people. After some time, they're often treated quite badly. Uh, the climate, especially in some of the smaller restaurants, is typically quite harsh, especially towards apprentices. Uh, so they, mm -hmm. they actually make the top of the list in, uh, in premature contract uh, terminations, which are almost 50% there. So in, in Germany, mm -hmm. that's maybe one aspect for you that might be interesting to know. Uh, in the first four months, you have a probationary period. Uh, and during this time, both the company and the apprentice can give notice for, for without having to give a reason, and they can just immediately terminate, uh, terminate it. Once the four months have passed, uh, the company then is no longer allowed to terminate the apprenticeship contract. Uh, unless there's some very, you know, strong reasons like the apprentice steals or, or something like this or, or never shows up for work or always late. Uh, but other than that, uh, the company typically can't cancel uh, the training agreement anymore. Uh, the apprentice can, uh, but only if the apprentice will switch the occupation. So, for example, if you're a, if you're a cook and you you just don't like the restaurant anymore. You can't uh, quit your apprenticeship and become an apprentice as a cook in the restaurant next door. You actually would have to to, to switch occupation. Uh, and I mean, that, that then relates to the whole financing idea because a lot of the training investment takes place, you know, initially, uh, where right. the productivity and skill task is still quite low. So the first year, year and a half is where the companies make the highest net investment. And then eventually... As apprentices right. become better on the job, uh, they pay back at least part of that investment. Uh, so if the, the quits occur kind of half a year before the end, and then it uh, or mid midway through, it's it's very costly. So they try to, you know, ensure that both parties really think about it. Do I want this? Is it a good fit for me? Uh, because also the apprentice knows mm, if I don't really like this hotel. Maybe I should quit now and try and get get an apprenticeship next door within four months and not because you also know you can't do it afterwards. And what about when you finish your apprenticeship? Are you guaranteed a job with that firm or is that another breaking point? Um, typically, it used to be the case that you finish your apprenticeship, uh, it's done and it's up to the two parties to negotiate a new contract. Uh, it has, however, now uh, changed in a number of uh, collective bargaining agreements uh, that for firms who are part of a collective bargaining agreement, now it says that you have to retain the apprentice for at least half a year and in some even a year. So that for some temporary period, you have to you have to keep them on. Uh, in other occupations, it's uh, it's not. But in, in general, uh, after the apprenticeship, is over you can do what you want uh, at the moment in germany you i think un un unless it really turns out to be a bad fit every company will be really happy to to offer permanent employment uh, but of course in the next recession that might change again i don't mean to hog the microphone here chris or others or you chris you probably know all this stuff anybody else got questions I would certainly say I don't know all of it, but it's, it's fascinating. There's there's some clear parallels between, you know, the system he's uh, providing us an update with and what we do in the United States. And there's there's obviously some strengths in the German system. Uh, in the American system, if it's a if it's a non-union shop, they can terminate you at will. Um, even on a union shop, they can terminate you provided there's cause. A little bit more of a process on the union side. Um, and then the chambers that you, know, you guys brought up, it's, it's definitely interesting because our chambers are much, 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 much more voluntary 
Um, so incredible advantage on the German side. I, I agree. But I, I will say, Mr. Senator, the, the thing I found the most fascinating was the, the age where you end the high school level of an apprenticeship for, I'm sorry, uh, high school for formal education that can transition into the apprenticeship or the next tier of your uh, your college pathway. That, that's a huge difference to where we're at. But um, fascinating to hear how his numbers are 50% below the age of 18. That's that's incredible. Great. We only need 45%. <laughs> that's, <it. laughs> that's our goal yeah. the swiss are actually even a little bit younger switzerland has for for all nine years of compulsory schooling in germany the average does this 10 if they're not doing the high school track so the swiss are even a bit younger and typically the swiss actually sign their training contracts in eighth grade so almost a year in advance so it's it's very young uh which of course you can say well is it is it too young <laughs> Um, so it obviously then makes it important that uh, during the apprenticeship there is a substantial amount of, of general education in it as well and not just not only things that are very specific to an occupation but that you have skills that allow you to uh, to switch occupations later on uh, and that what they maybe that's another aspect you may or may not know so if you let's say you you complete your apprenticeship as a cook and then you decide i don't like this so when i do apprenticeship as a car mechanic uh, you don't have to do the full three and a half years as a car mechanic but at least one year will will be deducted because you've already done an apprenticeship and some of the general subjects in vocational school you wouldn't you wouldn't have to do anymore uh, the same if you come from the academic high school track, you're 18, you finished high school, and then you do um, a cook apprenticeship. Uh, you don't have to take the history class in vocational school anymore and all that. Uh, and the apprenticeship usually would be shortened by, uh, by at least half a year, uh, possibly by a full year. Uh, yeah, and also, since we talk about that, if apprentices perform very well, uh, both in the company and in vocational schools, uh, then if the, the firm agrees, uh, you can also shorten the apprenticeship by half a year. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's uh, used quite a bit, especially now when, when skilled labor is, is, is scarce. Uh, you might want your apprentice to be to be done earlier so that you can use them as a, as a skilled worker. So help me understand this. So I'm 16 or 17 years old. And I'm in an apprenticeship. I am still taking non-career related courses, or not? Yeah, you do. In, in unless, that one, unless day you week. unless you have completed uh, that at the let's say in the high school track, um, then then you don't have to. Uh, but typically the apprenticeship curriculum in school will correspond to grade 11, 12, and 13. So if you have completed grade 11, 12, and 13 in the academic high school track, you, you no longer have to take the, the general subjects. You only have to do the, the cooking class or the hospitality class, uh, right, but, but not history but, and not political science. But when you say high school, high school in your words mean non-apprenticeship, right? No, that would be the, the academic high school track that's in Germany, that's right. that's the, what... the gymnasium, uh, which starts, uh, which would start, I mean, you enroll in that track in some states like Bavaria already in fifth grade, uh, but then essentially I'm talking about what, what happens after 10th grade, after 10th grade, you either do the apprenticeship or you do the, the academic high school track for another three years. That's, that's my impression. What I'm trying to understand is for the apprentice, who, for the 11th and 12th grade, we'll call them age 16 and 17, they are going to school a day or day and a half a week, right? From a scheduling point of view. Correct. And in that day or day and a half a week, they are taking both their technical classes and academic classes? Yes, yeah, so they, they have a subject called German. Uh, they even have some yeah. sports. They have uh, ethics, religion, uh, political okay. science, uh, that that stuff. But it's you know it's it's less than what you would get on the academic high school. Track. I, 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 and and then by they... again by occupation, if you're a car mechanic, you you know you have physics classes probably comparable to those in the academic high school uh, track yeah. because yeah. that's very relevant to you. But then other stuff you you won't get. 
But but I'm just saying from a scheduling point of view, that's 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 built into like a day or a day and a half a week, not five days a week the way we do it. Correct. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. That's really helpful. All right. Well, this is great. Thank you. I'm, I I return the microphone to <laughs> our chair. Um is any other questions from anybody? Thank you, Professor Milman. This is very interesting um, and uh, we really appreciate your time today. And this will be posted on the DLS uh, Apprenticeship Commission web, web page next week. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your morning. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It was nice meeting you all. Bye-bye.